Okay, great. Welcome back. So uh, just to reiterate, the, the slides you can find uh, at this location um, on my web page. So you actually just have to type this directly in. So this first part's my web page, and then this is the actual location of the slide. So there's not a link, but you can type that directly in and, and find them. Okay, so um, just to continue on, I, I wanted to spend a little time, um, let's see here, uh, a little bit more time on centrality and diffusion, and then we'll, we'll come back to the d diffusion more generally. So, so we talked about different centrality measures. Daron talked about the katz bonisich which is a variation of the eigenvector centrality measure. And what, one thing we can do is begin to see if there are real differences or whether these things are helpful and predictive in some level. And so what I want to do is just talk a, l a little bit about you know, a quick use of these as seeing if they can inform us a little bit about a diffusion process. Uh, so in particular, you know, one thing is centrality, the in, in position of a, of a particular seed node in a process that you want to diffuse or cause contagion, um, that positioning can be very important in whether something takes off or not. So when we talk about viral marketing, people are always interested in finding out who are the really influential people um, in, in Daron's talk, it's who the people with the high externalities in terms of those uh, game theoretic complementarities, who are the people that you would want to subsidize, for instance, to, to, to make something work. So how does the, the centrality of these first and form correlate and, and which sort of centrality measures are predictive? And uh, I'll talk through a little, uh, briefly a paper with um, Abhijit Banerjee, um, Arun Chandra Sikhar, and Esther Duflo. Um, where we actually looked at the fusion of a microfinance product in uh, rural India and, and sort of illustrate how you might look at some of these things. So what we did was we were looking at a, a set of villages in Karnataka. Um, a microfinance organization went in, and what they did was they, they actually contacted people in villages to try and tell them about an available loan program. And we mapped out networks and then tracked who they talked to and, and how that information dispersed. Okay. So we surveyed the village before entry, and then we, we have network structure, demographics, and then we have the, this diffusion process over time. Okay, so you know, part of the reason for looking at this is that when you look at the participation rate, say, in some program, you might get very different effects in different areas. And so in particular, in this case, you know, they're getting near zero participation in some villages and you know, almost 50% participation in other villages, and you want to know what's responsible for that and whether network information can help us dis, uh, discern that. Okay. So, you know, word of mouth is sort of essential in getting news out, and this can be important for policy implications. So if it's just that you need to get better information flows, that's going to have different policy implications from whether you, you have to um, actually encourage people in other ways to, to get, um, uh, to uptake the product. And I'll talk, I'm going to come back to that in more detail in a, in a minute. So here we are, Karnataka, and the, um, what we did is we went into the, these different villages. This is a, a particular village uh, mapped out. This one, we use a lot of different visualization programs for networks. This one's actually done in a, in a variation of R. Uh, so let me blow this one up. So, so here, these clusters of nodes are, are households. And they were asked a series of questions. So we designed a survey. And the survey asked them, you know, who, if you had to go borrow 50 rupees for a day, roughly a, a dollar, or in this case, a, in this village is a day's income, um, who would you go to? So, you know, they could answer another person. Then we could group these together at, uh, on household levels, and we have a network. So we have a network of borrowing rupees. And this is a directed network, as Jerome was talking. Some people could point to somebody else, and, and you wouldn't necessarily borrow in return. So you have some directed information. We're actually going to treat these as reciprocal networks because we're going to be interested in information transmission. And so if people are, are talk, exchanging money, then the idea would be you could, you could also exchange information and that could flow in either direction. Okay? So then you've got a bunch of other things. Do you go to temple with? Who do you ask for advice? And so forth. So from any village, you've got a whole series of different interactions. Um, we have 13 interactions in total. Who comes to you to borrow kerosene or rice? Who do you go to in an emergency for medical help? And so you can aggregate these up. And then you've got a, a, a network of the village. And so we'll build a zero one network where two households are connected if people in, are connected by any one of these particular um, interactions. 
Now these interactions tend to layer on top of each other, and so you end up with a typical household being connected to about 15 other households in the village. Okay? So now what we can do is we can examine how the centrality of these injection points, the first households that the bank talked to in a given village, correlate with the eventual diffusion of the microfinance product in the village. Okay, so they go in, um, it's hard to advertise these things in the village. A lot of the people are illiterate, they don't have uh, cell phones and so forth. So you go in and you tell a few people and then hope the information spreads. And so the bank told their employee um, to go and identify people. And what they did is they have identified uh, shopkeepers, self-help group leaders, um, teachers, and, and some political uh, designates. These were the people that the bank employees were told to talk to and to spread information through. And what we're going to use for identification is the fact that in some villages, they might end up talking to somebody who's fairly peripheral, it might have low centrality, and in other villages, they might hit somebody who's very well connected in the network. And that might be um, something that we can then see whether that correlates with the eventual participation. Okay? So there's variation just in, in who they ended up talking to in terms of the network position. Okay, so let's just look, we could look first of all at degree centrality. So for instance, we can look at the average degree, what we'll call these people leaders, the first people that they talk to in the village. And on, on, these are the different villages. So they, they actually ended up entering 43 villages. For each village we have then the average degree of the people that they talk to first, these injection points into the network. And then on the X, uh, the Y axis, we have the eventual take up of microfinance. So roughly between 7% and 44% were the, the, was the range. And, and here you see degree centrality seems to do nothing, right? There's, there's almost no correlation. In fact, it looks negative. Um, it's insignificant. But there doesn't appear to be a relationship between the degree of the initial injection points and the eventual take up. OK, so not so good for degree centrality. Um, so maybe, you know, as we talked about earlier, Degree centrality is not a great measure. Maybe eigenvector centrality is a better measure of what's going on. So you can go through. Um, eigenvector centrality does uh, correlate positively. It's predictive. You get a positive slope now. So if you're looking at the eigenvector centrality, you get a better prediction, at least a, co a positive correlation, significant correlation, um, between the centrality of those points and the eventual take up. So it does appear that at least there's a, a, a correlation here. And in particular, you, know, you can go through different centralities. Eigenvector centrality correlates degree um, insignificant. Here, what I've done is also co uh, correct for a bunch of covariates, and then degrees to, um, comes out positive but insignificant. Uh, so here, there's the number of households in the village, the self-help group participation in the village, uh, savings measure, whether the village has high savings or no, and then um, a cast uh, variable. But basically, you can go through your favorite. So here's the Bonasich centrality that, that uh, um, Doron was talking about. Between this, um, eigenvector seems to be the only centrality in this particular um, instance that, that matters. It's explaining, you know, the, you get some variation in the explanation. It's, it's doing better at explaining what's going on, but not dramatically, right? So you're at about 30, a third of the variation in, across these villages that's being explained. So one thing um, that you can do that's, that's very easy with networks, and I'm going to talk, this is going to be a lead into what we're going to do later, is you can build very simple models of the actual process that you're studying. And instead of taking off the shelf measures, you can use those as measures directly. So if we want to measure diffusion, why don't we define diffusion centrality directly? So define centrality by the process through which we think that things are working. So all of these are sort of ad hoc measures. And maybe it's not surprising that none of them is doing precisely well in this particular instance, because none of them were designed for microfinance diffusion. They're, they're just things off the shelf. So what we can do is let's define something we'll call diffusion centrality. And, and so the, the diffusion centrality of a node i, we'll put in two different parameters for it. What we can ask is, how many nodes end up informed if some node is initially informed, I, and then we just run a simple diffusion process. So what we'll do is each node is going to tell each one of its friends in a given period with probability P. So maybe there's a, if we make P equals 0.10, then in any given period, I tell my friends with a probability 0.1 about microfinance. And then we'll just run this for some number of periods. We'll call it T. 
Okay. So just to illustrate this, um, we start with some node, and then say we said diffusion centrality, we, we set P to 0.5 and T equals 4. Now we can go ahead and see what happens. So you know, we ask, so if we ran a simulation here, uh, after one period with a coin flip, they, they happen to tell one of their neighbors. After two periods, those people have told some people, this person happens to talk to his other friend and so forth. So you could go through and, and you just simulate this for, for some number of periods. And now I've, I'm doing it exactly in some simple process that we think might represent the way information would spread in a network. So this gives us a definition. After four periods, you know, this node informs 13 others in, in this particular simulation. Okay? So that gives us a measure now of how important we think this node is with respect to a very specific model of how information spreads. Okay. So we can do that for another node and you know, do the same kind of simulation. We get six for that node. Um, so it looks like the, the, the first node was twice as good as the second one in terms of people that might eventually hear about this. Okay. And now I'm going to tie this back to something that Doron was talking about. So diffusion centrality, one way to estimate this would be to actually just multiply the adjacency matrix times this probability P that I'm going to talk to a neighbor. And raised to the first power, this is just in my row, I'm going to get a P on every entry. So that tells you the expected number of times I'm going to talk to each one of my friends. And it's going to be zero for other people. If you raise this to the second power, then each one of them talks to people. You end up with how many people I would reach after two steps. And raising it to the third power, how many times I reach three steps and so forth. So what you end up with is if you sum this for t periods, then you end up with something which just tells you what's the expected number of times different people are going to hear from me after t periods of interaction. Okay? So that's exactly what this object is. Now, if you take this t to infinity, then this is exactly the, the Bonisich centrality that um, Daron was talking about if p is low enough for this thing to converge. So if it converges and you take it to infinity, then you get Bonisich centrality. But if you do it for shorter periods of time, you're going to get some other answer. And maybe that other answer is a better measure of, of importance in these, in these networks. Okay? So that's a, the, just a basic model. And what we did here is now put in diffusion centrality. And in particular, we've got two parameters to fit, both the P and the T. And so what we did was we actually fit the P from the data. So you can just ask which one of these things best matches the actual outcomes in the data. And we picked T just to be the number, the length of time that the villages were actually exposed to microfinance in, in terms of uh, trimesters. So how long were they actually, how long did the process operate? And it actually operated for different lengths in different villages. Okay? And so then when you, you know, run that, now you get a much higher R squared, not surprisingly because it's a richer measure. But what it does is it says we could use simple models to begin to operate on the network in ways that would allow us to uh, identify what we think of as the right notion of centrality and then go ahead and work with that in terms of this. Now, you know, obviously we have lots of issues of causation and so forth. We just have a correlation here. But now we have something which is at least um, more predictive and, and substantially more in terms of the variation in the data that it's exploring, explaining. Okay. Okay, so, you know, this just goes back. Then we've, we've gone through these, these various uh, points and, and we've got the, the networks. Um, seeing that the centrality measures are actually correlating in, in important ways with eventual participation, that's something that can have uh, implications. Okay, so now we're going to talk a little more about this diffusion and more on issues of identification, endogeneity of networks and network formation. Okay, so let me start by just stepping back and I'll I'm sort of come back to this at the end. So, you know, questions of diffusion and a lot of these questions of sort of peer influence and so forth have a very rich history in the literature. This is actually from Zvi Grilicki's um, 57 paper, uh, which goes back to an earlier study um, from the 1940s on, say, that this was the diffusion of micro, of, uh, sorry, of um, hybrid corn in the US. So hybrid corn was uh, introduced in terms of 
being marketed uh, in, in, in different states at different times. Um, but basically, it, it takes uh, an adoption curve. So these are the years, and then there's the eventual fraction that was adopted. And one of the things that, that people find as an important characteristic of diffusion curves is they have actually very specific timestamps to them. And when we get into these models, we'll be able to recreate these timestamps very, through a very simple model like the one we just looked at. So they start out fairly slowly, then you get this sort with, you know, the, what's known as the hockey stick part, the, the exponential curve moves upward, and then things eventually have to asymptote because you're gonna hit 100%. Uh, so things go up, they slow down, and in this case, it, it depended on the state, and, and Grilla Keys goes through a whole series of hypotheses as to why there's differences across states, and can you explain the particular shapes of these? Um, but you know, simple diffusion models can answer a, a lot about whether a product is efficiently used in, in different contexts. Okay, so when we start thinking about diffusion of a product or technology, there's gonna be a whole series of different things that might affect things. You know, these complementarities that, that Darren was talking about in choices, um, we, we also have just basic awareness issues. Uh, I might not be aware of a new product, and, and the fact that my friend has it um, can help make me aware of it. Um, learning about value, so there's actually interactions in terms of learning effects. Uh, there's all kinds of fad and fashion imitation issues. And then there's these other issues that, that the, the, are going to cause problems for us in terms of the characteristics that we have that are similar across individuals, which might correlate with the actual de decisions we're making. So all of those are gonna be at work. And one thing we might wanna do is begin to dissect the diffusion process. So if we wanna look at some, some of these interactions, we might wanna go inside the fee that, that Daron was looking at in terms of what these interactions are. So there's an uh, interaction between the decision of one individual and the other, and separating those out can be important. And it can be important because different forms of these interactions have different policy implications. So if this is something which is uh, just purely making somebody aware of something, then it means all we have to do is get the information out. If it's something where there's a real learning effect, then it might be that we need richer information to get out. If it's something where there's true complementarities, then subsidizing particular individuals to take things up can be important in, in getting things to work. And all of those are gonna be different policies, and one policy might fail miserably if it's the information issue as opposed to a complementarity issue. And so understanding which of these things are at work is important. So we not only want to understand what the network effects are, but sort of dissect them a little bit. Um, and so in terms of identification, uh, let's put up a slide here which sort of talks through some of the issues that, that are, are present. And there's a fairly long list um, and, you know, and sort of how to deal with these things. And you know, one is these sort of field or natural experiments. So pseudo-random injections in the Indian data, um, the, the assignment of roommates that uh, w w was, was talked about earlier in terms of uh, you know, assigning people in different situations where you can actually have some control over the interactions. Uh, IV approaches, um, the, you know, exploiting the network position, as, as Daron mentioned, can have some difficulty. Uh, sort of a, this one is, has a difficulty with endogenous networks and unobservables and making sure that you've actually got the right thing measured and, and that the, uh, the treatment of, of one individual isn't correlated with characteristics of another individual. So that, that's something which is fairly difficult. Um, one thing that I, I think, you know, as Daron pointed out, this is a really promising avenue in the sense that if you can find something like these royal roads, which you think is an instrument which somehow could cause the network in ways that are plausibly exogenous to, to other aspects of the behaviors, that's wonderful. Um, I put rare here because I'm not sure, it, it's hard to think of a lot of situations where you're gonna have that wonderful uh, an IV variable that you, that you think you might be able to trust to, to construct the network, so, so that's somewhat difficult. So what I wanna spend the time in this lecture talking about mostly is other approaches where you're really dealing with observational data, and what we're gonna try and do is, is go through some structural modeling and the structure, use the structural modeling to try and understand what kinds of implications we should be getting from different kinds of interactions and use those to try and separate things out. 
And of course, in, you know, the, the real difficulty, as we all know from these kinds of approaches, is that we're gonna, it's gonna be model-based and we're gonna be stuck with some of the structural modeling uh, uh, assumptions, but th they can help us sort things out. And then I'm gonna talk at, at the end explicitly about bringing the, the network formation modeling in to the picture where we, we explicitly use that as a model in conjunction with the model of behavior. Okay, so I'm gonna do this in sort of two pieces. And, and so, you know, here what we're gonna do is we're gonna use networks in sort of a richer way than just mapping the peer effects, and we'll model the diffusion to identify the behavior and, and track information's uh, diffusion over time. And so, so I'll talk about the identification in just a, a second. Okay, so let's go back to this Indian data that we looked at in terms of the diffusion and talk in more explicitly about what might have been going on in that setting. So we have basic information diffusion, okay? So just awareness. Um, does, does a loan exist? Is it, is it possible for me to get the loan? And secondly, we've got all kinds of other peer inf influence, endorsement, or a game on network kinds of effects, which are if my friend gets a loan, then maybe I can borrow from them. So maybe I, I can free ride on them and I don't need to, to take out a loan. Or maybe if they get a loan, I can see that it's improving their life and I wanna get a loan now. Um, or maybe I just like to be similar to my friends and, and follow similar behaviors. So you can imagine a whole series of, of different kinds of effects which would re represent themselves in terms of either strategic substitutes or complements. And then there's this other part which is just purely being aware of things. And what I wanna do is just talk about at least cut it, making a cut here where we can separate the first from the second part. So we go back to these networks and now we want to do this, this kind of um, analysis. And let's start with just a simple, we, we just do a straw man uh, analysis. And the straw man analysis is we're going to look at um, a particular person or household I's choice of whether or not to participate in this loan. And they're, they're limited to one loan per household. It's women uh, between the ages of 18 and 57. Um, there, there's some restrictions on it. So they're allowed to get a one loan per household. So we'll do things at the household level. We'll look at the, what's the probability that I chooses to participate. And in particular, let's look at a, just a simple logistic regression of the form. We do the log odds ratio is proportional to some characteristics of the household and also um, uh, on the friend's participation. And so this, if this is positive, then we've got some sort of strategic complements. If it's negative, we've got some strategic substitutes. And here I'm not being careful about the uh, the identity, you know, some of the endogeneity issues that, that Daron was talking about. I just want to do this to, to sort of get a first cut at this, okay? So we go ahead and what do we find? Um, you get a 2.5 on this coefficient and it's highly significant. So it looks like there's a strong complementarity between people's decisions to get, to take out loans and uh, it's significant at the 99 point whatever percent you care in this case. Um, so what does is, what is this coefficient actually translate into? If you change the fraction of my friends taking out loans from, from zero to one, that increases my odds ratio by a factor of 12. Um, if you take it from basically one standard deviation in the data from 0.1 to 0.3, it's about a 65% a increase in my, my odds ratio. Okay? So this is a very substantial effect. So it looks like there's really strong interactions in terms of households' decisions to, to take out loans. Okay, so now the question is we want to dissect this a little bit and cut into it to try and see how much of this is information and how much of it is, is other things. And what I want to do here is now talk about importing that model we just talked about of diffusion into this setting and then layering it with the decision and trying to redo this but doing it conditional on people's information. And so then we'll be able to separate out at least whether people are informed and then conditional on being informed how much do their neighbors matter. Because one reason that I could be seeing this strong effect is that I'm just much more likely to, to know about this product if a lot of my friends are using it, and I'm, I'm less likely to know about it if they're not using it. Okay. Okay. So we know this set of initially informed nodes. Um, these nodes repeatedly pass information, uh, and, and basically once they're informed, then we'll, we'll allow them to make a decision to, to take up microfinance or not. Okay, so let's enrich the behavior slightly from what we had before. So the, the diffusion model we were looking at before just had one parameter, 
of passing probability, which is what's the, I, I have some probability of telling my friends about uh, a, pro, a pro product. Now what we're going to do is have two different numbers. And we'll have one number if I did not participate. So QN is what's the probability I tell my neighbors if I didn't participate. QP is what's the probability I tell my neighbors if I did participate. And so one idea would be maybe this is higher if I'm a participant, I'm much more likely to be talking about this new loan program. If I decided not to participate myself, I'm less excited about it. I'm, I'm less likely to tell other people. Okay? So we'll run a simple model like this, and we'll just do the same kind of model. So we know who the first informed individuals in the village were. They go in, they tell these individuals, and now we have these two probabilities. And so this person, for instance, decides to participate in the program. This person decides, his household decides not to. So then we can go ahead and run the diffusion process. And what's going to happen is now, if the QN is higher, or sorry, lower than the QP, this person is going to tend to tell more of its friends. And so more of these people end up informed, and now they make decisions. But now we can rerun the regression, the, the logistic regression we just did, but now we'll do a conditional. These individuals are going to make their decision. These individuals all have a neighbor who's participating. This individual has a neighbor who's not participating. So they might make different decisions based on that. And, but now we're doing this conditional on them being informed. Okay? So we, we reiterate. Some of them decide to participate. Some don't. And then we rerun this and, and so forth. And so we can do this all by simulation. right? So we just simulate this. And then that gives us an eventual pattern of exactly who ends up um, participating and who doesn't. Okay, and, and let me just, um, so then conditional on being informed, then we redo this same analysis, but only for people, once they become informed, then we look at their characteristics, we look at the fraction of their friends around who are informed already at that point in time, and then they make their decision based on that. Okay, so that's the, that's the procedure. Okay, um, now we can go ahead and we can estimate these just by simulated method of moments. So we simulate the model. The model then gives us different predictions and of, of who's going to be informed at which points in time and how they're going to make their decisions. And then we'll just choose these parameters to best match the actual data. So we'll, we'll pick a series of moments in the data, look at the simulations, and, and match the parameters. So is it clear what the technique is? So, so here, for instance, you know, if we go through, we simulate this. If we set QN to 0.15, QP equal to 3, and a peer effect of 0.5, then we would end up with certain kinds of, of patterns. Um, if we ended up with other parameters, if we make QP much higher and QN much lower, then things are going to diffuse more from the initial, the, the initial participating node and less from the other one. Okay? And let, let me sort of emphasize one thing of where the network is mattering here. And it, it's mattering in a different way than it did in what Daron was talking about. So in, in we have two sorts of, of identification that are coming from networks. One is just who my neighbors are. And that allows me to directly estimate in these influences, although with, with all kinds of problems. And then we have a second one, which is what's the overall network structure. And what we're doing here is we're using that overall network structure to actually keep track of the diffusion process. And what's going to happen is people who are very far away from the initially no informed nodes are going to have much lower probabilities of ever hearing about stuff. And people that are much closer are going to have higher probabilities of hearing about it. And using that variation allows us to actually map out the model of diffusion. So that's what's giving us the QNs and QPs, is looking at people at different distances. And we know people close by should end up with high probability hearing, and people that are much further away might have a lower probability of hearing. And depending on what the actual drop-off looks like as a function of network distance, that'll help us identify information transmission. And then once we can condition on that, then we can go, re go back, redo the peer analysis, and using that peer analysis now, then we can get an estimate of what was the effect net of becoming informed of the peer on, on a given person's decision. Okay? So that's, that's the basic idea. Okay. So when you go through and you do that, um, what do you end up with? Uh, you end up with um, QN being about 0.05, QP 0.55. Now the peer effect appears to be actually slightly negative and insignificant. 
and you get a, a significant difference between this QN and QP. So what it does is it, 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 it suggests that part of the, at least the, the model, if you take the model at, at, at face value, what the model is suggesting is that the reason that you're much more likely to take up if you have lots of friends are, is because they're much more likely to talk about it than people who didn't participate. And once you make that correction, then the peer effect, the peer interaction here, the coefficient pretty much drops to zero and, and uh, looks insignificant. So at least in these data, you get something where it's the awareness and not the actual peer interaction, which appears to be the, the, the driving force, okay? So, so that's, you know, this is subject to the issues of the structural model, but at least this is um, one interpretation of it. And, and, you know, you're getting a big difference between what you would get if you didn't account for the actual explicit diffusion process and sort of separate out where this complementarity is coming from. And the complementarity seems to be driven by, by this QP factor as, as the real driving force here. Okay. Now, what, what this is suggesting, I, I think, um, you know, the, you, you get these kinds of, of effects from it. You can then do all kinds of counterfactuals the same way that Daron was talking about doing counterfactuals on what would happen if, a, if you did a particular policy in one of uh, their cities and see what the impact would be in other cities. Um, here you can do the same thing, you know, what, what happens in terms of how important are non-participants in passing information, what would happen if you encouraged more people or if you spread information more widely to begin with, you know, what would be the changes in take-up rate. So you can use these models fairly easily to do um, simulations. But I think that one, one thing I want to sort of emphasize here, just, you know, given our limited time and so forth, is that these models are actually very simple to build and to fairly and, and to simulate. So doing a, a model of, of diffusion on a network is a, a, a fairly simple object to work with. And the identification, if you've got data which is reasonably rich in the network stuff, you can get a lot of identification out of, you know, just by looking at who's in which positions in the network and how their um, behaviors are changing by position. And there's some endogeneity that we still have to worry about in, in terms of position, and that's going to be another sort of theme that we'll come back to. But, but modulo that, these things can still help us dissect a lot of what's going on. Okay. Okay. One thing just to sort of uh, point back, um, if you take the same model that we were talking about and then you simulate it with different networks, so you could talk about you know, networks where the average degree is three, networks where the average degree is six, nine, and so forth, and you look at the take up over time, you get curves that look remarkably similar to you know, what the kinds of things that um, Gorilla Keys was, was uncovering. And so these simple network models actually can recreate the timestamps of these things fairly simply. And you know, the reason that you get this kind of take up uh, sort of hockey stick ex exponential acceleration is fairly simple. You've got a few ex nodes initially informed. Once they start telling neighbors, then you've got exponential growth just in terms of this process going out in a tree-like fashion that we saw in the first lecture. And then eventually it saturates the people who have made the decisions, uh, have made their decisions and, and so forth and, and things taper off. So you can get these kinds of pictures very easily from these models and, and they're a typical timestamp of this kind of diffusion model. Okay. Um, so what we've, we've you know, talked a little bit about the, this structural modeling in, in one part. I want to come back to sort of something that both Daron and I have, have mentioned a number of times, um, modeling network formation and how that can be incorporated into this. And, you know, network formation, uh, what, what are the sort of the challenges driving the current literature? Well, multiplicity is something that we, we're used to dealing in, in structural I.O. We have all kinds of models that have multiple equilibria. Anytime you're putting in strategic complementarities, you're going to tend to have lots of equilibria. So that's sort of an issue which is a strong one here. As Daron mentioned, you know, sometimes you can assume it away. Other times you, you get a control on it by some lattice arguments. You can talk about bounding, max, and min equilibria. There's a whole literature on here. I, I'm not going to go into that just because I think a, a lot of the insights you already have from the I.O. literature it can be imported here. It's, it, there's not something that's dr dramatically new in terms of the network issues on multiplicity. Um, what is new is sort of integrating the formation process here with behavior. And so I'm going to talk about two things here. One is, you know, how do we, how do we integrate formation with behavior? 
And then secondly, um, how do we deal with link dependencies? And uh, I'll end with the link dependencies. Okay. So um, always lurking, we have these correlated unobservables. And uh, people's behaviors correlate with the network position because of homophily. And so we want to deal with that directly. So what I want to do is, is just take you through an example. And this is an example from Goldsmith, Pinkham, and Imben's paper from uh, last year. Um, it's one that I, I think uh, a bunch of us uh, commented on in, um, in this room. Um, it's, it's sort of a very interesting paper. And let, let me just take you through the basic logic of it, because I think what's important to take from this is, is the logic more than the specifics. But the structure is simple enough that it illustrates the point very, very easily. OK, so what have we got? We've got um, some YI here, the, some behavior that we're interested in. In, the, in their case, it was GPA. Um, they were using ad health data. So you know, the same friendship networks we looked at uh, earlier. You've got your own uh, characteristics. You've got some behavior of the peers, uh, some characteristics of the peers. And here, what, let me put in here, as they did, explicitly we'll, we'll keep track of something that we didn't observe. So there's some characteristic which uh, is affecting this person's behavior that we don't observe. <coughs> And what's the, the difficulty in, in this estimation is it's not only entering in terms of this person's error, but since this affects this person's behavior, that means that other people's errors are also affecting their behaviors, which in turn affect um, your behavior. And so this means that now we've got correlations. If, you know, this is just an explicit way of, of pointing out the correlations in the error terms, right? OK, so these are unobserved, and we want to um, deal with them. So what's the, the, the nice thing that, that they do? OK, let's suppose that we explicitly measure uh, model homophily and network formation. So what we're going to do is we're going to say people get utility from being friends. And in particular, let's let the utility of i from a friendship of j depend on several things. One is just some, you know, We'd like to, we're very social animals or whatever. Um, then we've got uh, an effect on the differences in their observed characteristics. So this, if A1 is positive, then um, you, you're, uh, you like to have people that are far apart from you. If A1 is negative, then what you'd like to do is you'd like to form relationships with people who are very, very similar to yourself, right? So you'd like to, this to be minimized. You'd like it to be 0. Um, so A2, similar things in terms of the unobserved characteristics. Okay? So we've got this utility. And uh, you, know, they, you can put in a bunch of other stuff here, in particular with the kind of things that they actually throw in there. You can put in past network relationships. So maybe I, I'm, I'm more likely to want to keep relationships I already have. So there's some inertia value past friends in common. So maybe I like to be friends with people who are friends with my friends, um, and so forth. So you can throw in a bunch of, of other things in, into this equation if you want, or, or whatever you like in terms of the, the structure. OK, so what's the basic idea? The basic idea is we're going to try and estimate these unobserved characteristics directly from the network itself, and then use those to go back into the original equation and put those in and then figure out what we might not have observed and how that would affect the outcome. OK? So is that, is that the structure clear? So what we're going to do here is what we, we've got these two equations. And we're going to say that links are logistic in ui of j and uj of i. So in particular, what we're going to assume is that there's, uh, they assume, is that the probability that i and j link to each other is um, proportional to the product of a logistic function of these two things. So high utilities for both people of each other make it much more likely that they're going to link. Um, high utility, higher utility of one makes it more likely, but you know, it's, it's a product of the two um, utilities that's going to matter. So what they're going to do is then estimate the system. And you can do this by Bayesian methods is the way they do it. You could do it by MLE. Uh, you know, whatever method you, you happen to like to, to do your estimation. So what we're going to do is we're going to infer the 
um, unobserved Zs. And by doing that, then we can begin to actually estimate what this parameter is, and that can help us correct errors that we might have had in these other parameters by now correctly including this in the equation. Okay? So that's the, the idea of the structure. Now, let me give you the idea of you know, where does the identification come from. And the identification comes from the following observation. If I and J are connected, if, if you see two people who are connected and they actually have very different XIs, then it's more likely that they have to be similar on the ZIs, right? So, so somehow if, if we're connected and we look different on the observables, it's probably that our unobservables must be similar, otherwise we wouldn't have been friends. And if you see people that aren't linked with similar XIs, then they're more likely to be different on the unobserved characteristics. So what we can do is begin to infer whether people are similar or different on the unobserved characteristics by whether they're friends or not on the observed characteristics. And using that all together, you end up estimating, um, the, when you estimate both of these together, now you can well identify what this B4 is going to be. Okay? Now, the trick in doing this is, is you know, th th there's going to have to be assumptions about the particular structure of these. So for instance, they do at 0, 1, we're either you know, both um, uh, the, ones on zi, both zeros, or, or one's a zero and one's a one. And by doing that, this thing is, is identified up to a, a sign change on these things. But then the sign change carries through the whole thing, and so you, don't, you can actually un undo that. So there's, you know, we're either similar or different, basically. Now, uh, depending on the, the particular form you might fit, um, you might have a harder time identifying it or, or not. But, but, but the idea here is, is now you go through, you infer these un, uh, unobservable Zs, um, and you can begin to correct for that. And you're observing it directly by, by modeling the network formation process, taking a homophily model of network formation together with your interaction um, uh, equation and then est estimating those at the same time. OK, so what, you know, what's the lesson from this kind of approach? Accounting for link formation can help infer unobservables. Um, it can help correct estimates of strategic interaction with friends and, and acquaintances. Obviously, this isn't a panacea um, because we still have the other kinds of endogeneity issues that, 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 that Daron touched on. So it's, it's dealing with one piece of it, and it depends on how rich our model is of the interaction and the underlying homophily, the better that model is, the better you're going to be able to make inferences about what must be going on behind the scenes, and, and otherwise you, you might not uh, you know, uh, get much out. Um, and interestingly, when they go through this exercise with their data, um, they end up finding that this doesn't make much of a difference in the... They, they find, interestingly, there do appear to be um, some strong complementarities in the homophily of, of forming the links, so they get that, that people really care about being similar on these unobserved characteristics, but then the unobserved characteristics don't seem to matter much in terms of influencing the GPA and the observed characteristics in the, in, in the actual uh, ad health data seem to be rich enough to, to not have been affected much by introducing this in their particular data. Now that begs the question, there's a power of a test here which you, you begin to have to worry about the power of the test is only as rich as the model of homophily. So if I've got a really poor model of homophily, it might be that people are, are um, connecting in ways that I'm not picking up, and therefore I'm not getting a good estimate of what the behavior looks like. Okay. Um, so, so let me uh, go on with one sort of other point, which I think is, is really important in, in terms of the network formation literature. And... This is uh, an, an extra layer of, which, of, of complication on things, but I think it's, uh, it's probably one of the more interesting ones in, in the network literature. Um, link formation is correlated beyond the characteristics of individuals. And, and what do I mean by that? It, the idea is that, that you know, part of the, if you think about the people you know, some of the people you know you actually met through friends. You actually meet them through the network. And that means that there's going to be a correlation not only in characteristics that are coming up, but actually in the structure of the network today can influence the structure of the network tomorrow. So who you have access to and who you might become friends with is actually already influenced by your, your current network. And the difficulty with that is now it means that link formation, however 
complicated it is in terms of characteristics and so forth, is no longer independent across individuals. So we can account for all the characteristics we want in the world, but the fact that, that I'm friends with Daron means that I've met a bunch of people through Daron that I wouldn't have met otherwise, and you know, my friendships with them are, are dependent on, on, on that relationship. And therefore, I, I can't treat any of those relationships as being independent of this relationship. Okay, now what's the, the, the problem with that? And, and actually, you know, there's, there's a lot of theories as to why this might occur. So one is the one we just mentioned, um, just meeting prop, it's a meeting process. I'm more likely to meet people through people I know. Another one is that I'm, uh, that there's actually reasons for having closure. So closure is a term that Coleman, James Coleman, uh, talked about a lot in, in a, an important 1988 paper. Um, closure being, you know, the fact that, that two of my friends are friends with each other can allow them to sanction me and to keep track of me and, and uh, keep me in line through incentives. So there's all kinds of values actually to having closure in terms of, of uh, local networks. Um, there's theories in sociology about uh, pressure and, and, and competition among groups and the tendency to try and force closure um, within uh, a, a group. Um, and just to sort of illustrate this, let's take a look um, at, at what's known as clustering coefficients. So this is something which is also quite um, ubiquitous in the networks literature. So when we look at a given individual, one who's friends with both two and three, we can ask, what's the chance that two and three are friends with each other? Right? And there's, you know, there's a, a lot that's made in the uh, literature about the fact that this tends to be fairly high. So when you look across networks, you know, there, there's a, an old study now that I certainly wouldn't get by any IRBs um, of, of looking at, at friendships among prison inmates. Um, this is from 1960. Um, so here you see that this closure rate is 0.31, whereas when you look at the typical link probability in the network, it's about 0.01. So you know, here it's about 30 times higher that if, if I have two friends that they're going to be friends with each other than just picking any two people in the network and asking if they're friends with each other. And you look at these you know, similar things when we look at these co-authorship networks, you know, then the, the, the probability that random people are connected to each other pretty much goes to zero, and yet you still see high probabilities. And that's partly because people work in, in teams now, and um, you know, so the, there's going to be interactions, and they're likely to be working with each other. Um, if you look, go back to the Florentine marriage and, and business dealings, um, there the, you know, the clustering's about 0.46 versus 0.29 in that network. But, so what you tend to see is you do see correlations in these things. The correlations are substantial. These are uncorrected for all kinds of observable characteristics, but even when you go through what are known as stochastic block models and you do corrections for the characteristics, you still find a lot of residual correlation more so than, than should be there at random. So it, su it suggests that these relationships are correlated, and therefore, if we want to deal with, with network formation models, we have to deal with that correlation. Okay. Okay. So we can't talk about probabilities at the link level, and this is the main challenge. Um, now we've got a difficulty. Once we make link IJ correlated with JK and, and JK with KL and so forth, now the whole set of links in the network become a correlated object, right? So they're all correlated. And now we, one way to view this is instead of having probabilities over links, we end up with probabilities over a network structure. And the difficulty is that I, I, we can't actually do, we can't even enumerate the, the probabilities of different networks coming up because there's too many networks and we can't do these kinds of, you know, doing a Bayesian calculation or a likelihood calculation requires looking at what's the probability of this network relative to some alternative network that we didn't see. And that calculation becomes impossible because we have exponentially number, many networks to do and we just can't do that. Okay. Okay, so models, uh, how, how do people deal with this in terms of models of network formation? So this brings me full circle back to the first paper I wrote with, with Asher. Um, we can go back and one possibility is, you know, you just start being very specific about the network formation models. So you write down utilities for individuals, you write down exactly what you think's going on, and to some extent with very simple models, you can actually make equilibrium kinds of predictions about networks. What's the difficulty with that? Multiplicity, you end up with lots of, of 
networks. It's very difficult to do this at a tractable level. There's a whole series of papers that have sort of followed in this vein. There's papers of, that are sort of random network models where you, you grow these over time. And some of those are reasonably flexible and you can actually take to data. Um, but they're not sort of general models that you can deal with and, and take to, uh, um, to, to, you know, to any given network structure. So what, what happened in the literature was the, the workhorse model, which is you can think of as sort of the regression equivalent in, in network world, is what's known as exponential random graph models. And those grew out of, of papers by Frank and Strauss originally and then were imported into sociology by Wasserman and Pattison and Snyders and Hancock and so forth. And what they started doing was using um, MCMC techniques. So, you know, I want to talk about the probability of a given network. What I do is I specify that probability in wh however I want. In this case, it's an exponential form. And then to, to get an estimate of how likely this network is relative to other networks, I go ahead and I specify, I, I just do a random sampling of possible networks via some um, MCMC technique or other technique where I walk through a network space, pick a few networks, and say under my model, how likely would these alternatives be? And now I can pick parameters to sort of maximize the likelihood of the network I saw compared to the networks I didn't see, right? So I want to say the parameters look good if the network I saw is really likely and the networks I didn't see were unlikely. And I just have to pick a bunch of networks um, through some MCMC techniques. Okay. A uh, long short story short, there's really serious estimation problems with that. So there's actually some really nice papers um, coming out of the statistics literature in the last few years that have basically shown that this problem is, is really impossible. And the only way you can actually walk the space and get a consistent estimator is if you walk it ex exponentially long or you have approximately independent links. And if we had approximately independent links, we wouldn't be in this story to begin with, right? We would have, we would have been where we started. So basically, there's a, there's a real serious problem in the estimation techniques, and, and these things don't work. Um, so there's different ways out of this. Uh, one way is, is using stochastic block models. Um, Brian Graham's been working in this a little bit. Um, so there, what you do is, is actually you, you, you recreate this high clustering, not by having a lot of dependence, but by having really specific local characteristics. So if people, if you have enough characteristics that, you know, part of the reason you say that I'm friends with Daron and then end up friends with Bob as well is because maybe we all have exactly the same characteristics and, and we, you know, we, we really finely define those characteristics. So you can generate a lot of local structure by just having a really fine um, characteristic grid. Um, another way you, out of this is stuff I've been doing with Arun Chandra Sikar, which is instead of working, it, we can still have correlation patterns in our structure, but not at the whole network level. And the way we work with that is you work at subgraphs, and you start talking about probabilities of various subgraphs appearing. And you work with probability models directly on subgraphs. And doing that, you can actually show that you get um, consistent and, and easy estimation procedures by, by, instead of working at the whole graph level, you work at, uh, at a local level and then aggregate upwards. And under some appropriate sparsity conditions, um, you, know, you can get ni nice kinds of estimation out. So I, you know, we don't have time to go in through a lot of these. But what I wanted to point out is that effectively, you know, um, the networks are going to tend to be endogenous. So if we go back to the, um, the, the Goldsmith, Pinkham, and Imbens kind of approach, you know, we've got endogenous networks. Accounting for that endogeneity explicitly can help us out in trying to understand what's driving uh, the, the behavior. If we can understand why these people are friends, we can do better at understanding what they might be doing in, in, in reaction to each other. And we need models of network formation. And right now, the literature is, is basically producing those things, but it's grappling with a difficult problem of link dependencies at, that, uh, that are really strongly prevalent in a lot of instances and cause serious calculation and, and practical estimation problems. But there are ways of, of dealing with these things. And, and those are things, I think, that, that are sort of the, the um, current research frontier. OK. Um, so actually, in terms of broader messages here, uh, simple network models 
we saw like this diffusion model. They're easy to set up. They can help us estimate and dissect kinds of effects. Um, the network structures do have you know, tractable and intuitive ways to quantify d despite their, their complexity in terms of the, the implications for behavior. We're dealing with um, you know, th this kind of way of, of simplifying the complexity. There's different ways we can represent these networks and that helps us then understand some of what's going on and whether or not we're focused in on homophily or focused in on some other aspect depends on the particular application. Um, you know, I, I talked through identification. Let me sort of give you a, a, a sort of a, a bucket list of, of things that I think are, are current topics that, that are really um, sort of interesting going on in the networks and economics literature. Um, you know, one thing that's sort of amazingly sat by the wayside for a long time um, is international trade and international relations. So these things really are networks at the heart of them. And, you know, which, if I'm trading with one country and, and have agreements with them, it makes a big difference in what agreements I have with other countries. So ter in terms of trade and international relations is something that's important and, and sort of um, has, there's a few papers there, but not uh, nearly as many as we need. Financial interconnections, uh, I think Doron's going to talk a little bit about in the fourth. So, you know, talking more generally about Im implications of shocks in one part of an economy spreading in another. Um, development has been probably the area, it's been really encouraging to see sort of the explosion of network research there. And I think that's because out of all the contexts, it's the most evident one where it's pretty clear that people have communication patterns that influence all of their decisions and, and a lot of their behaviors. And so understanding learning and diffusion and social norms, it's pretty hard to escape the networks. And, and now that we have better and better methods of, of measuring them and dealing with them, um, they've, they've been uh, popping up. Uh, Daron mentioned games on networks. I think one area that, that's important is, you know, often we don't take these actions just once, but they're repeated. So if we're talking about risk sharing, cooperation, favor exchange, all these things, they are, are happening over time. And we, we really need, um, you know, we, the repeated games have been two by two kinds of games for a long time. I mean, two people, sometimes more than two actions, but they're, they've been fairly narrow in, in their application. And this is a setting where understanding repetition of interaction is important. Um, Peer effects in games on networks is, you know, separating these interactions and, and getting identification and understanding policy is, I think, a central one. Homophily, um, the why of homophily is very important for understanding what its implications and informing policy. So these two things are the sort of, uh, you know, core of what we've been talking about so far. And econometrics of network formation is something I, I, I basically touched a little bit on. And I think, you know, understanding endogeneity and behavior and overcoming a lot of the the reflection problem, identification problems, and all the endogeneity problems that are out there, these are, are really important things. And lastly, um, the sort of looming dynamics that we haven't uh, dealt with. So that's another big issue. So that's probably a, a good time to um, stop and ask for some questions. If people